Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Friedlander. You've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPNC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former trainees. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Friedlander page on our department website at www. Dot neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question into the Q&A chat box. We'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event, or if you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. <clears throat> this week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished neurosurgeons, Dr. George Zanonos. Thank you for being here with us today, Dr. Zanonos. As for that, Dr. Friedlander, thank you, and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin. A pleasure to be with all of you here uh, today. As I usually do, I wanted to provide a little summary on where we are with COVID uh, in the region as well as in our hospitals, and then uh, provide an introduction uh, to my friend, Dr. Zenonos. Um, COVID uh, has a uh, you know plateaued to a certain extent. It's starting to go down over the past. Uh, week uh, or so after we've had a pretty significant uh, second uh, largest peak uh, recently. Our hospitals uh, remain uh, full, and uh, but we still want to make sure that we're able to take care of everybody as, uh, as needed. And, and when, when they come, a lot of the other hospitals around the region are also suffering uh, uh, from constraints and their labor and other things. So, you know, for us, it's really important to be able to take care of, uh, of every single patient as well as we can. Our hospitals uh, have always been and remain very, very safe. We take extreme measures uh, to make sure that everybody's as safe as possible. Just about everybody that works in our hospital is uh, vaccinated. Uh, so again, having a lesser chance of both them contracting and as well as uh, uh, getting other people uh, infected uh, with the virus. So uh, our hospitals are very safe. Uh, our department uh, continues to perform a lot of uh, telemedicine where we're able to see our patients with them not having the need to even come uh, to the hospital. Obviously, if they need to come, uh, they need to come. We do a lot of in-person visits uh, as well here uh, within uh, the hospital. So my message uh, to all listening and, and our patients uh, uh, is to make sure to contact us uh, and see us uh, if you need it, because delaying care obviously can be very dangerous. Uh, I heard this morning uh, from, uh, from uh, Pfizer as an example that they've uh, uh, developed a, a new therapeutic uh, for patients uh, that uh, have COVID. I haven't read the details, but something needs to be given early on, but really uh, stops the disease from progressing and less likely for the patients to need to come to the hospital uh, or to die from it uh, when these drugs are, are uh, administered. So again, uh, there's a, uh, I see a brighter and brighter light at the end of the tunnel with a uh, vaccinations again i feel very very strongly that uh, everybody should be uh, vaccinated obviously there's strong uh, thoughts of one way or the other but i really think it's uh, the the critical way out of this is uh, vaccination and continued vaccination because the virus will change as it has already but uh, also with a uh, new therapeutics that uh, we get uh, new uh, opportunities um, Talk uh, about our, our speaker uh, today, Dr. Zanonos, is uh, a, a good friend of uh, mine. Uh, I met him uh, initially when uh, he came as a uh, medical student uh, from uh, Greece uh, to Boston, uh, where I was uh, at that point. I remember all the residents uh, in Boston were uh, essentially uh, pleading with me that I should take him into my laboratory uh there so he would have a, a path towards uh, being uh, trained in the at the brigham where i was then or at least in the uh united uh, states i i took him in and you know one of the best decisions i've made uh george is uh, incredibly uh smart i can uh, embarrass him a, a little bit that uh, with you know, he had the highest medical board scores and in both uh, Greece and when he took uh, his uh, neurosurgical boards here in the United States, also got the top score in the country, which is uh, very, very uh, impressive. So not only he's a uh, book smart, uh, incredibly smart, uh, both in research uh, as a surgeon, uh, very, very talented surgeon. Uh, he was our top pick uh, for residency here in uh, Pittsburgh, where he completed uh, his uh, residency and did an unfolded uh, fellowship 
uh, under Dr. Gardner, as well as the ENT group, Dr. Schneiderman, Dr. Wong, uh, to perform an infolded uh, uh, endoscopic uh, and skull base uh, fellowship. This is uh, uh, this center, as uh, you know, uh, in my biased mind, but I think I'm being very fair, is the top endoscopic center in the world uh, for skull base uh, surgery. And Dr. Zenonos also did a, a fellowship uh, with uh, in the University of Miami with uh, Jacques Marcos, uh, and then came back. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to recruit him back uh, to uh, Pittsburgh. So I was delighted that he uh, is here with us. He's uh, uh, been with us on faculty going on three years uh, now, doing fantastic, fantastic work, uh, exemplary surgeon and academician. And we'll be talking uh, today on the history and development and collaboration in a multidisciplinary skull base uh, 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 center. Uh, the University of Pittsburgh actually has the oldest uh, skull base center uh, in the country, and we have a lot of things uh, to celebrate, and Dr. Zanonos will uh, go and describe that, that to us. So George, uh, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to your talk. Excellent. Um, Robert, thank you so very much again for this um, a very kind introduction. Um, I'm not sure I, I deserve um, a lot of it, but um, you know I'm obviously extremely indebted to you, and and that goes both ways in in terms of um, uh, your guidance and, and leadership here. Um, I know for sure this uh, Fridays with Friedland ha has been a hit. Uh, I've been receiving a lot of unsolicited comments by patients as well as others. Um, and I myself have enjoyed many of uh, many of these episodes. Um, we recently had uh, the uh, the institution of uh, the skull base chair uh, in uh, skull base surgery, um, and um, I thought that would be a good um, opportunity to, uh, as you said, celebrate uh, our history here. We're very proud, obviously, of this center. Um, and talk about the evolution of um, both the techniques as well as the um, the principles and uh, and the research here, and also the future, which I think is very bright going forward. Um, so um, we're just gonna discuss a little bit uh, from our perspective, you know, about the evolution of this center and and skull based surgery in general, uh, both here and the world, and. Um, Many times it's a little bit uh, difficult to define what skull based surgery is, uh, especially to patients or um, even medical personnel sometimes that are non neurosurgeons. Uh, but this, uh, for the longest of time, has been this kind of non discrete area where the brain sits on um, that's sort of on the frontier of uh, neurosurgery, um, ophthalmology, uh, otology. Um, rhinology, head and neck surgery. Um, and for the longest of time, again, when a neurosurgeon was, let's say, doing a procedure, removing a tumor, it was going, uh, it was reaching into the eye or in the ear, the paranasal sinuses or the head or the neck, you know, uh, people felt uncomfortable. It was an unfamiliar anatomy. Um, there were many booby traps there and, and people were very hesitant to, um, to cross those boundaries or vice versa, an ophthalmologist and otologist when they're, they were going towards the brain. But obviously tumors and pathology don't respect those boundaries. And there are many, many diseases that cross those boundaries many, many times, um, and we have to treat them adequately. So if we um, stop where, uh, where the tumors, uh, wh where our um, expertise stops, then um, we're obviously are, are not doing the best service for the patient. And um, that concern by by the specialist wasn't unfounded because you know this this base of the skull is literally riddled with very very important structures the, uh, the arteries that um, provide the brain with uh, blood um, the the veins that drain the blood the uh, many cranial nerves that allow us to um, eat swallow breathe do all these very very basic functions. Um, even the brainstem, um, the, the uh, optic nerves, um, they're all passing through this very, very busy area that is called the skull base. And for this reason, every time, you know, somebody uh, would try to go a, a little bit beyond that, um, there, were, there was a price to pay for that. And that's why for the longest of time, this was considered a frontier, uh, to some extent, no man's land. 
Um, so we've talked a little bit about where this is, uh, but the, the good thing about it, and the, the silver lining is that um, most of the diseases that actually arise in this area are benign. Um, so, and even though, you know, as we discussed the very complex area, um, this is essentially a very high risk, but also potentially high return um, kind of surgery as uh, we could even cure people as opposed to many of the tumors around arise within the uh, brain itself. And for this reason, skull-based surgery has also potentially the highest potential to um, get the surgeons in this a state of flow that uh, many speak about, uh, where you're completely absorbed in a in a, uh, in a um, uh, ongoing process, which requires very it, it poses a very high challenge, but always also requires a high amount of skill. Um, so in in a way, it can be seen as a, an extreme sport in, uh, in neurosurgery or or the other specialties that overlap with skull base. Um, and as with extreme sports, um, these are becoming much safer and much more doable when done as a team. When every part of the team has a superpower, when uh, the appropriate equipment is available and where things are planned appropriately, um, things are no longer this, you know, um, very dangerous event, but they're more calculated and, and doable. And that's exactly what skull base surgery is. And that's how it was born out. We'll discuss a little bit how it was born out here at the University of Pittsburgh. But um, it's many, many um, practitioners and surgeons and, um, and uh, medical physicians that work together for the best of the patient um, in many uh, aspects of their care, both in and outside the operating room. Um, and this mentality that everyone wanted to work alone, they didn't want to interact with others, um, that only made us uh, slower and, and uh, it created boundaries. But um, as they say, alone we go faster, but to, together we go further. And today the, the Center for Cranial Based Surgery here at the University of Pittsburgh is comprised by many um, surgeons as well as uh, physicians um, going from neurosurgery, otorolaryngology, and all the subspecialties within it, neuroendocrinology, ophthalmology, oculoplastics, radiation oncology, neuroradiology, neurooncology, neurophysiology, and neuroendovascular specialists, among many others. These are only a uh, few of the people that I can uh, list here. Um, and um, when a patient presents to our department currently, they're evaluated by all the specialties that their disease is relevant for, and that uh, makes for a much better care overall uh, because one looks over the other. Um, there's uh, a much less chance of anything getting missed. Um, and um, uh, each aspect of the care is treated in the highest degree possible, whether it has to do with the eyes, the nose, uh, or any other uh, aspect of the care. And this, this uh, tradition of caring and treating patients from start to end uh, goes on from the minute they walk in the door and see one of us uh, to the time that they're released from clinic by by everyone. So, um, and we're very fortunate to uh, have developed this uh, way of working together, and um, we, that that speaks in in the outcomes of of the patients as well. Um, I'm going to use an example. This is a patient actually that um, had seen one of our neuroendocrinologists had. Um, uh, classic signs and symptoms of acromegaly, which is a, a, a tumor that produces growth hormone within the pituitary. Uh, it has some invasions of the cavernous sinus, but remarkably also on the MRI, it was found to have an aneurysm uh, that was uh, embedded within the tumor itself. Uh, and we know from work that was done here that uh, particularly these tumors, uh, when they're invading the cavernous sinus, um, they can be sites of recurrence if we don't do a very thorough job. Uh, in removing these remnants uh, within the walls and the membranes around um, the uh, pituitary, which increases dramatically um, the um, technical aspects of uh, the surgery. And this was described by Dr. Juan Fernandez Miranda, who was kind enough to share some of the schematics. But you see here how the small tumor is left in the linings and how we can remove it, be much more thorough. In, in removing the tumor and achieving endocrinologic remission 
um, with uh, the patients not requiring any more radiation or, or medications. And, and this has been shown to be very effective. Um, but uh, the aneurysm was a problem. So I did discuss the case also um, with my endovascular partner, Dr. Bradley Gross, who did an angiogram. Um, and uh, Dr. Bradley Gross is extremely talented and also very thoughtful. Um, and in thinking about the options here, we, we really didn't see a very good option that was an endovascular option. He didn't just treat the patient for the sake of treating the patient um, and saying that he was able to do that. But we knew that the patient would be, if, if he would receive like a stent, he would be on, on dual on dipleo therapy for six months and then requiring to be on aspirin for life. We discussed about doing a less uh, aggressive procedure, but uh, none of the above was actually ideal for him. So what we had decided is that we could potentially tackle both at the same time as we had done uh, similar things, but not exactly like things before. Um, and um, this obviously, as, as we discussed earlier, increased the uh, technical aspects and the difficulty of the procedure. And this is just the video of the procedure that was, um, was put together by one of our trainees. Um, here you see how we are um, creating a much wider exposure that uh, normally would be required um, by, by just a pituitary surgery. And we're entering that area called the cavernous sinus and um, exposing the carotid artery for what we call proximal control so that we can have a handle in case there was a rupture in the aneurysm. We also saw the sixth nerve come into view earlier. Uh, and then also going distally to the aneurysm uh, to um, get a handle of the artery on the, on the other side, what we call di pro distal control. And these are um, practices that we usually do for vascular neurosurgery, which is an important skill for scalp-based surgery. You see where the aneurysm is there. Um, and we go on to very carefully um, separate it from the normal gland. Some of the involved membranes are removed from, uh, from the tumor itself. Uh, but we're not done here. We know that this membrane that is called the wall of cavernous sinus is also involved with tumors. So if we don't remove that, the patient is going to require further treatments, likely, if it's not immediately, uh, most surely in the future. But this is um, these membranes are stuck on the aneurysm. So in order to remove them, we have to carefully separate it from them. And uh, because again, from work that was done here at the University of Pittsburgh, we understand much better the anatomy of these ligaments uh, and these structures as we were able to effectively remove them. And this is the last bit that uh, was involved with tumor. And while we're here, although this aneurysm um, wouldn't require surgery in and of its own, uh, given it's exposed, we're able to address that at the same time with a clip, which is the, you know, one of the most permanent solutions that we can give uh, preserving the small arteries that give uh, blood to um, the optic nerves, which you can see above, as well as the pituitary. Um, and, and, and now we're able to address both. The patient did quite well. Uh, there was a questionably a, a small uh, remnant at the neck, which is um, uh, inconsequential for the aneurysm, but uh, in complete remission and, and uh, hopefully um, uh, a long lasting remission that will require no further treatments. As we discussed a little bit earlier, there are many things to celebrate here at the University of Pittsburgh. There were lots of firsts and many pioneers. Um, so we were recently again at this uh, gala for the institution of a chair where, again, I heard um, Dr. Myers and Dr. Maroon speak about how they first did the first combined uh, skull base case at UPMC and how um, just this mere um, willingness to go uh, to somebody else's office and tell them, listen, I, I think we can do this better if we work together. Um, that's where it essentially comes down to. And, and, and these two uh, pioneers and luminaries were able to work together to remove a very challenging tumor um, at the time that, you know, and walking on paved uh, roads at the time. Dr. Sekar and Schramm had the first comprehensive book on skull-based surgery, um, again, from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, they were the first to create a comprehensive academic center in North America that was dedicated to skull-based surgery. Uh, and they're also the founding members of the North American Skull-Based Society, which is currently the largest skull-based society that is known and is multidisciplinary as, uh, as we discussed. Uh, it's comprised not only by neurosurgeons, 
by ENT surgeons, oculoplastic surgeons, otologists, head and neck surgeons, plastic surgeons, and, and so on and so forth. Um, Dr. Janetta was uh, the first to pioneer microvascular decompression uh, here, and, and Dr. Lunsford, by bringing the gamma knife uh, unit, the first radio surgery unit in the United States, and publishing most of the known literature about it, has really revolutionized the way we treat these tumors. We don't always go um, for mutilating procedures that could potentially change the quality of life, but we are much more um, reserved in, in what we do, uh, preserving quality of life as we have very good alternatives for, for many times benign tumors. Dr. Joe and Corral were the first to report the endoscopic and nasal pituitary surgery, and then many others here refined these techniques, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, as you can understand, you know, the progress is not like a straight line. It's not, um, it's not straightforward. It has uh, many twists and turns and uh, not always uh, things go smoothly. And uh, this is largely um, dependent on some um, uh, accumulation of knowledge and trial and error, but also uh, the evolution of technology. And we know that the roots were back in the 16th century with, uh, with Leonardo da Vinci first describing cranial nerves. Then we had um, some more developments in the 17th surgery with things really moving slowly and people not even understanding basic concepts of anatomy. Um, there were some adventurous souls and like 100 years later that, that tried some skull-based surgery with really poor results. Um, but it wasn't until the 19th surgery when we understood the, um, the concepts of asepsis and anesthesia, cerebral localization, where um, things started to make much more sense. Um, and we really have started having an explosion of this field in general uh, with the introduction of the microscope and microneurosurgery, Gazi, Azugil, uh, Pierre Donahue, and many others. Um, and then the development of uh, surgery through the nose had its um, origins again uh, at the beginning of uh, the 1900s uh, with Schoffler. Again, these were very extensive procedures with Cushing, uh, Oscar Hirsch, uh, Norman Dodd, and, and many others. Um, but uh, with the uh, help of many, again, luminaries in the introduction of the endoscope, um, we were able to uh, take uh, both the illumination as well as our view to the target itself, almost coming in, almost uh, analogous to coming out of the Pittsburgh tunnels, uh, where we are able to see much more at the side of what we're doing things, understand the anatomy, so we're actually able to do much more with the tumor in a safer fashion. Um, and this um, went through many iterations, but again, it culminated with uh, uh, Drs. Joe and Corral here at the UPMC. Uh, who, who are credited with uh, the endoscopy endonasal pituitary surgery as the first one who did it. And, and you can see the difference of what, how you can see one and the other. Uh, a much better illumination and uh, tissue di differentiation um, with dynamic endoscopy, um, being able to move again the, the field of view exactly what we needed and do exactly what we need. Um, there are many iterations. I'm not going to speak in detail. We could potentially look around corners uh, with these uh, tools, uh, again, to avoid um, uh, dangerous um, uh, areas such as the carotid arteries and the cranial nerves. Um, and, and the notion is that we work together, again, by keeping two, four eyes on the, on the field, um, four hands uh, and two minds. We're able to work together to uh, take out very challenging uh, tumors and, and deal with uh, challenging pathology in the base of the skull. There is development of specialized instruments that allow us to do surgery just the same way we would do them if we did a traditional approach. Um, and we're very fortunate to work with um, the, one of the best neurophysiology centers in the world that um, allows us to see exactly and to know exactly whether we're hurting the patient, or whether we're close to something uh, that uh, needs to be preserved even, even though we don't directly see it um, with uh, direct visualization. This is another example of, of, uh, of monitoring such a cranial nerve. Um, another tool is the, uh, the endoscopic Doppler. Um, but most importantly uh, is, is this revolution in understanding um, the anatomy from this minimally invasive approaches 
uh, in the concepts of um, understanding how we can translate uh, things we knew or even things that we didn't know um, into try and deal with this pathology through the nose. We we're lucky enough to have um, uh, had to have had many um, research uh, fellows. These are ENT surgeons, neurosurgeons, as well as other specialists uh, from around the world that come with us for uh, one year or two years and work in the anatomy lab and uh, frankly have taught us more than we have taught them in, in terms of uh, both anatomy and new approaches. Uh, and Dr. Wendy Fellows uh, has, has been instrumental in keeping the anatomy lab uh, and um, the surgical um, research going. So by understanding all that, we're more and more able to um, delve more into the base of the skull and, and deal with more pathology um, in, in a complementary way with the traditional approaches, but sometimes going further and further, uh, making many of them obsolete. These are many of the approaches that were developed again, that were previously over the years uh, impossible, going further and further into the base of the skull uh, and uh, giving the access to remove uh, tumors or deal with pathology that was previously um, uh, incomprehensible in a way. Um, and uh, again, with over the years, the evolution of all these approaches, we're moving away from some of these mutilating procedures, which were essentially the um, how how uh, things were done uh, not too long ago, uh, probably 20 or 30 years ago. Um, we would have to split people's faces in order to get uh, to where we needed to do. Um, but fortunately, with many modules that and uh, and tools that we have over the years um, uh, produced, uh, these are much more straightforward and, and it's knowledge that is uh, freely available to everyone. Um, many times though, even though we try to do things minimally invasive, um, there's a role for, um, for other approaches as well when these are uh, indicated and we should not be um, hesitant to use them if we think that this is going to be better for the patient. For example, this was a patient that uh, presented with essentially almost no vision on the left side. We have we found that she had this very complicated tumor um, in the base of the skull that was essentially constricting, completely encasing the left optic nerve. Um, it was uh, pushing it from both above and both below with the larger amount of the tumor being below. But we thought that the best way to approach this was by actually giving some more of the nerve above before having a lot of bleeding and a sensitive nerve from below. So we did a small approach, again, a keyhole approach, but a, a more of a traditional approach to decompress the nerve uh, from the side. I'm going to speed it up uh, a little bit here in the, uh, the name of time. Uh, coming in as a multi core approach uh, from the other side eventually to um, remove the tumor from the other side and create like a 360 decompression of this optic nerve um, with as much um, as comprehensive of, uh, of uh, removal of the tumor um, as uh, as was possible. And you see this, this is the optic nerve, how free it is uh, compared to how it was before. Um, and we're able again to 360 decompress this nerve uh, we did this without manipulating the nerve, which was the whole point uh, of using um, our armamentarium of both open and, and uh, uh, endoscopic approaches, uh, but still being able to do it in a minimally invasive way. And um, even a year after, this was there's no evidence of coming back. But more importantly, because again of this um, of this strategy of not manipulating the nerve, but varying our approaches so that we avoid that. Uh, should gain essentially or nearly normal function from hand motion uh, um, eyesight on that side as she was able to uh, to be able to read and do everything she needed to and these are her visual fields uh, again starting by by dr maroon uh, originally we have many keyhole approaches uh, that start around uh, the eye um, for example, either uh, through the eyebrow from a small incision around the eye using the opening of the eye as well, or the eyelid, uh, or the um, uh, the side close to the nose. Um, 
So this is an example of one such patient. I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into many details here, um, but where we uh, were able to use this keyhole approach um, to remove the tumor um, with a complete removal of the tumor. And these are the kinds of results where you, you get uh, when using, when working together with oculoplastic surgeons um, for the best cosmetic results. And I will dare most people to try and find which side the surgery was on, um, even though um, we're equally effective in removing these tumors. Uh, this is another kind of uh, procedure. Uh, and some more examples of patients. Um, and again, this is a patient that had a very small incision here. This was a, a few millimeter incision. And I, I, would, um, I would argue that it's very hard to see that even when I tell you it's there. It's also important to um, keep uh, advancing the field. Uh, currently, uh, with the help of our research manager, manager Benita Velapel, uh, there are many, many ongoing uh, clinical trials um, and uh, trying to understand the impact of what we're doing on patients. One thing that I was um, very uh, closely involved with uh, was the understanding of the genetics of uh, one of the diseases we treat. Um, called the skull based chordoma. We really, these are relatively rare tumors, but we see a lot of them because of uh, where they arise and uh, the, the fact that uh, the approaches that were developed here are very ideal for them. Um, but we really didn't know exactly one from the other, meaning uh, which one is going to behave in an aggressive way and which one is going to be much more benign which one of these uh, tumors is going to require radiotherapy afterwards or which ones we could potentially spare it, uh, sparing also the potential morbidity from radiating uh, patients in that area. And we have done uh, some work uh, previously identifying some uh, clinical markers. Most recently, um, we were able to expand on that. Uh, and we saw that even for patients that had complete resections, the outcomes were vastly different based on, on their genetics. Um, we went even further, and by putting all the data together, we are able to stratify patients in, in three groups, um, with the group C being the worst prognosis and always requiring radiation. Um, we uh, recommend radiation now only for group P patients that uh, do not have a complete resection. Um, and uh, um, with group A patients, we found out that um, these are also associated with a different phenotype, meaning that these are younger patients, uh, these are smaller tumors, which uh, also essentially affect the outcomes by uh, being more amenable to uh, uh, complete resections. And essentially, we came down to personalization of care with very clear guidelines about what to do based on the individual genetics of the tumor. And this is something that completely changed the way we do things, not only here, but by sharing, sharing through the literature uh, in other um, uh, places around the world as well. Um, it's some ongoing work uh, that we're really excited about. We took that even further by working with Dr. Rivka Collins lab, uh, who is an expert in radiomics. Um, that is, um, is a, this concept, uh, and this is something that's very hot in, uh, in radiology right now, um, is that there's so much beyond of what we can actually see and sort of our gestalt uh, about what we see on a scan uh, with our naked eyes. The, the uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithms could extract many, many uh, more uh, parameters and, and much more information <laughs> which is available actually on the scans that we get anyway. Uh, so the, the tumor's texture uh, and the variations it has from different sequences, as you can understand, is likely very tightly related to its microarchitecture, to its interaction with uh, the surrounding tissues, its vascularity, and ultimately its genetics, but also its potential outcomes and how it should be treated. Um, and uh, this follows a, a very clear pipeline of uh, getting the MRI and then uh, finding out where the tumor is, analyzing it. Um, but mostly afterwards, essentially letting the, um, the algorithms, uh, both through supervised but also unsupervised algorithms, uh, to see if there are groups of patients that we can identify based on this differentiation of textures. And something where it's just right hot off the press, uh, we just submitted an abstract, but I feel comfortable with sharing some of this information is that 
uh, very clearly, um, uh, there are clusters of patients, even with radiomics, that have a very clear uh, impact on survival. And that's before we even get a piece of the tumor, before we even do surgery. That's before we do anything. That's just based on an MRI, completely non-invasive and costing really nothing as we, we have this information anyway. Uh, but not only with outcomes, we also can have an idea of the patient's genotype and the, the tumor's genotype that we know actually based on our prior results can guide management. So before even we take a patient to surgery, we have an idea, uh, we could have a clear idea about what might follow afterwards. And obviously this may guide our treatment as well. Instead of um, uh, not knowing during surgery, it may change dramatically what we do during surgery. I work with working with Dr. Uh, Samir Agrignori, uh, one of our fellows, Dr. Zard Garcia is, is working on some other uh, parameters for these tumors as well, uh, looking much further into the epigenomics, um, the metabolomics, um, and the um, proteomics of these tumors to, to find out more. It's also important to spread the knowledge. I recently found out that there were over 2,000 participants in and, and many of the courses that go on here in order to um, disseminate the knowledge of how uh, to perform safely these cases and effectively. Um, and um, I'll close by, by saying that, you know, the skull-based surgery has really transformed dramatically over the years and uh, from something non-existent to something that's um, very safely performed. Uh, UPMC has played a central role in it, um, and um, we're really proud uh, about this. Um, that uh, the, the evolution, though, has not stopped. This is an ongoing process. We always want to try and make things uh, better, more effective, and safer for patients. Um, and uh, really, the future is bright. There's a lot of good things that are coming. Um, but more importantly, this, um, the excellence is, lies, again, in these premises of of working together, uh, putting our brains together, our hands uh, and our hearts to some extent uh, to try and, and eventually come up with something better. So um, this is uh, all I had to present for today. I know I, I went a little bit off uh, the time, uh, but I'll welcome any questions. Thank you, Dr. Zanonis. Uh, what an incredible uh, presentation, very inspiring. Uh, we're gonna begin with our Q&A portion of our presentation. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Uh, Dr. Freelander, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Justin and George. Really fantastic uh, presentation. You really uh, exemplified what's what's amazing about the, the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC is, is the combination of putting amazing people together. Um, again, I believe we have uh, the best surgeons in the country and the world uh, here, putting them together. But not only that, if, if everybody's in an island, you can only do certain amount of things, but uh, really working together and pushing the envelope. Uh, so much uh, of uh, neurosurgery uh, has been uh, developed uh, here in uh, the University of uh, Pittsburgh and in particular in our school based center, as well as uh, many other uh, initiatives like uh, gamma knife and microvascular decompression, uh, for for example, and I really liked uh, how you went in the and described the different uh, collaborations, not only clinically with uh, ENT and ophthalmology, but also with our researchers. Our our department, uh, you know, has the largest number of uh, NIH funded investigators, uh, neurosurgeons, clinical neurosurgeons as an example, and uh, a lot of the work that uh, that uh, you are doing uh, could be targeted uh, for that uh, as well, given how impactful it is. Um, um, you know, the, when I think of uh, the NIH as an example, it's not the National Institute of Basic Science, it's the National Institute of Health, and the work that, that you're doing with uh, some of your colleagues are uh, very, very apt. Uh, uh, really to to push the field and push the boundaries and the, the uh, environment and culture that we have here in the department that uh, really, really prime uh, for for that work. But with setting that up, um, George, if you think of what you're going to be doing different in 10 years than now, um, i.e. what are the next advances? Uh, wh what do you think uh, we're going to be looking back and saying, whoa, I can't believe we did that, but we're doing something else now? Well, the, the hope and I think there's a lot uh, that's brewing at this point that 10 years may not be uh, as 
uh, over optimistic as we think. But uh, the hope is that we probably not don't won't be able won't have to do many invasive surgery anymore. Uh, that you know uh, perhaps sometimes that the neurosurgeon role would be to uh, biopsy some of these lesions and get tissue um, and then you know by targeted therapies that again we may not have to um, deal with a lot of these tumors that we're dealing um, and then you know patients can have a much better quality of life by not having surgery at all so I think um, there is it, it looks it, it, it sounds very far-fetched um, but Knowing how much data is already available um, and uh, how much people are working and with, you know, uh, AI and, you know, what uh, what Henry is doing, <laughs> hopefully, um, that much of this information can be harnessed. And uh, I think that would really, we're, we're going to leave like a, another revolution soon. Yeah. Hopefully not too far. <laughs> Yeah, a, a lot of what you're doing is uh, pushing the envelope, uh, as, I, as I mentioned. Um, what, what what makes you nervous going into the OR? Um, everyone, I think every surgeon, whether it's a simple procedure or a more complicated procedure, is um, you always have this, I don't want to say contract, but you know, you um, when a patient tells you that, um, you know, my my life is your is in your hands, and it sometimes it doesn't matter if you're doing something very simple or something more complicated, it's kind of the same thing. Um, it it to some extent when you're trying to push the envelope, um, it has to be be for the right reasons, and it has to be um, with everyone in complete understanding. Uh, what are the risks and benefits and, and um, what, what exactly the goals are. Um, and uh, being completely transparent, I think, goes a long way um, in, you know, whether in, in decreasing the, that, that part of being something new uh, to something that, you know, is done all the time. Um, it, I don't know. You you have much more experience than I do, and I don't know if that ever goes away. Obviously, you know there's um, there's variations into how much um, uh, someone is nervous, but um, I, I feel that much of it disappears when you're actually in the operating room. Um, it, there's always a component that's sort of lingering always, but um, many times when the drapes are down, it's it's that component of uh, flow that um, that we spoke about earlier where you know maybe 12 hours have passed and you don't realize you, that they have passed and and exactly it's when you're in that in that state I think that the best outcomes happen as well so um, they always the goal is to to be able to disconnect in a way and be immersed in a way that you get to that point I think yeah no, George I I loved your answer from uh, many different uh, angles so because uh, um, you know, every single patient that we have, we can, if something goes wrong, their life would be devastated. And again, it could be something very, very simple or the most uh, complex uh, uh, procedure. And again, what, uh, a little bit of where I was going with pushing the envelope, uh, a lot of times you're doing things for the first time ever. It, it's, it's a variation of, of, uh, of a procedure, but it's uh, it just hasn't been done before, and that's that's very exciting. But you know, we have the responsibility with every single patient, and uh, we know it. we we play it. Uh, nurse surgery is a high risk um, activity, and uh, you know, m luckily uh, most things go well, but uh, you know there there are complications, and you always uh, uh, you have to be as a neurosurgeon very secure when you go to the OR. You can't be doubting yourself too much. It's always good maybe to doubt uh, a little bit, but you have to be very uh, confident uh, once uh, you're moving there. So really uh, great answers. Uh, I'll transition to Justin. Uh, do you have any uh, questions uh, from the audience? Thank you, Dr. Freelander. Yes, uh, we have a, a number of them uh, that sort of uh, revolve around the sort of crystal ball. What do you see as the uh, is the future. I know that you were sort of asked that question here, but just a couple of comments uh, I'll start with. Um, impressive slide explaining all of the quote unquote first in the skull-based program 
uh, no doubt you'll be a part of the next. So a nice comment there for you, George. Another one, I'm a former patient of yours and I am so grateful for your care. Um, and uh, another one from our, our own Dr. Maroon, who's on the call with us. Uh, uh, absolutely terrific presentation and overview, George. Congratulations on your, uh, your own personal accomplishments and contributions. So um, thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, thank you, George. Um, so how about, uh, what have you learned from some of your most challenging cases? Um, that, that nothing is insurmountable to some extent. That is, you know, sometimes think, um, things may feel like a mountain uh, when you're starting something, uh, but by, by keeping an even keel um, and um, not, not letting that overwhelm you, uh, try to think methodically and, uh, and, and stage things and, and, and go through them in a very logical manner uh, that things are doable. Um, there are many, many, and, and vice versa, that if you, if you lose that, um, even in simpler things, um, that's where uh, danger lingers, is when you uh, lose this absolute focus that I think um, is more dangerous even if something simple. So that's that's what I, I tell the residents many times, you know, when we, we look at a very terrible tumor, a very terrible disease, um, and we have a plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G about it. Um, the majority of the times actually, you know, you know, things go fine. It's it's when you let that guard down uh, for any reason that uh, danger lingers. So, um, yeah. Thank you, George. Um, who or what inspired you to choose your career path in neurosurgery? It's a great question. I <clears throat> I was always in sort of in awe, even when a medical stu uh, student, um, of the brain and how it makes us who we are. Uh, how much more things is sort of going to space in a way. It's just had this ode to it that. Um, it just m m made beings beings um, and humans humans. Um, but uh, I also am a very pragmatic person and you know I liked the directness of how you could fix things, um, how you deal with the physical world as opposed to just sort of abstract um, notions and things that happening that you couldn't necessarily feel or uh, very uh, directly change. So um, the combination of the two was the answer, I guess, and the answer, the neurosurgery was the answer. Um, it also had, um, I knew that there was going to be, there wasn't going to be a day in my life that, you know, you wouldn't have the challenge. Um, like what Dr. Friedlander was saying earlier, um, you know, there's always that that lingering feeling of the challenge and um, that nervousness of what you're doing. Um, so it, th there's a never a day that goes by that you feel, OK, you know, that was a boring day today. Um, it's 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 very hard to say that. Um, and it's also um, the, you're treating for the sickest of the sickest patients at the majority of the times. And it's an honor and a responsibility. And um, it, it just keeps you going. It, it's sort of uh, when when they do burnout um, uh, scores and many specialties are you know neurosurgery is almost always even though um, I would say we work uh, much more than the majority of surgeons etc um, and probably have many many of us have um, uh, tensions in the family because of that etc you still um, we don't we're not bored by it. Uh, we're, we're doing it because we love it. So um, I don't regret making that decision. That's excellent. Thank you, George. Um, how much does high definition fiber tracking play in your work? That's a great question. Um, so the answer is that it, it actively right now, it plays more role in the um, 
uh, intraaxial tumors um, and some of the gliomas, et cetera, that really help us and they're much more defined. Um, the work for cranial nerves and how to identify the cranial nerves is not quite there yet. Um, but uh, with one of our residents, the one, one of the hopes is that um, we are going to be using high definition fiber tracking uh, to potentially, along with you know, a scoring system that uh, we're trying to come up with, um, to estimate who is going to get better after surgery in terms of the vision. The vision is a very well defined track um, that goes from, from the eyes essentially to the back of the brain. Uh, it can be measured, it can be understood better. Um, so understanding, understanding how much it is viable um, with high definition fiber tractography, I think it's going to be a very useful tool going forward um, in advising patients, planning the surgery, uh, and really changing our understanding of who is going to get better even before we, we go to the OR. Excellent, thank you. Um, what do you think is the most important factor in training residents in these complicated approaches? I think um, is the 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 concept of uh, that everyone has to learn to walk before they run. Uh, that uh, you you don't learn a lot of these procedures on a patient. Um, there's a lot of work that has to happen both with reading, going up to the lab, you know. Uh, speaking with your attendings, uh, going back and forth about about the surgery, uh, asking intelligent questions while you're in the operating room, and and then eventually once you once you understood that and have that 100%, um, then then you try some of the more complicated things because there's there's really no room for error. Dr. Lunsford always said um, when working with residents is always good when if you feel that there's any time where if something went wrong is it's not salvageable um that then that's a different situation and if that's the case um you have to be sure that whoever is doing whatever uh part of the procedure um that they absolutely know what they're doing they're not just figuring it out at that at that moment um i think that's a that's a very important thing to keep in mind Excellent. Thank you, George. Um, how do you balance the demands of training residents and conducting research with providing such exceptional care to your patients? I think they're saying you have a lot on your plate, George. How do you keep it all together? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I do many times. That's a, that's a problem. <laughs> but it's definitely challenging. I think you have to make the time. That's a let's say sure you have to arrange your schedule, um, set deadlines, um, and try and, and stick with them. Uh, and, you know, set absolute deadlines. And if, if that doesn't happen by a certain time, then, you know, you have to change your schedule to some extent in order to, to accommodate it. But something has to give. It's, it, there's no question. Uh, there's no time for everything, so. Thank you, George. I think we have time for one last question. I think it's a good one to end on. Uh, what makes you most proud of uh, being a neurosurgeon at UPMC in the University of Pittsburgh? Again, I think is this uh, notion of, uh, you know, the people that I have around me. I feel that, you know, uh, it, it, nothing exists because, you know, there's one single person here. Uh, if uh, all of us are replaceable to, to, to an extent, uh, but at the same time, you know, th this place has a life of its own. It has a, a spirit of innovation. It has a spirit of um, driving things forward. Um, that's going to that's gonna be here no matter what. Um, and, and I think I'm, I'm really proud of, um, at least for, uh, for a glimpse of it, uh, being part of that pushing things forward. That's excellent. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you again for today. It's an incredible presentation. Uh, thank you to our attendees. Uh, again, if you have any questions or would like to learn about ways to support the work that you've uh, just heard about here, uh, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. Uh, Dr. Friedlander, would you like to close us out for the day, please? 
You know, thank you very much and really fantastic uh, presentation, George. Very proud of uh, what you're doing and really eager to see where your career is going to uh, lead you. Um, uh, you're going to do uh, great things and uh, looking forward uh, to being part of it and witnessing what uh, what you're doing. Uh, next week, we're going to take uh, a break. A uh, week uh, after that, uh, I'm delighted that we'll have our director of our spine uh, service, Dr. Kojo Hamilton. We'll be talking about uh, complex uh, scoliosis and deformity. Uh, fantastic uh, clinician, surgeon, and, and human being, so I know you'll enjoy it. Uh, we'll see you all then. Have a happy and safe, safe weekend. Take care. Thank you again. Bye to everyone.